his people. And we've been excited. We've been in a series called Lovers of God, and some great things have been coming out of that, and we've just uh, have had a wonderful time in that series. Last week, we had Pastor Christian Kennedy. He was with us uh, sharing about unforgiveness and uh, just receiving God's forgiveness as well and bestowing it upon others. And so today, guys, we're going to kind of close out that series because next week we'll just be celebrating the birth of Christ. Amen. I'm excited about that. We'll be ex- somebody's excited back there. Yes, sir, Patrick. <laughs> We'll be celebrating the birth of Christ, but today we're going to close out our series, Lovers of God, and I get the honors of doing that and wrapping it all up. But I'm go back to our, our theme scripture of this entire series, which is 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 it says this, it says, but know this, this is the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy. Now, here's the thing, guys, when you, when you hear that scripture... And you think the Apostle Paul is talking about people that are outside of the, the, the family of God or the church. No, he's talking to Timothy about people that are in the body of Christ, okay? Because it's easy to sit there and like, okay, well, he's talking about people that don't know God. No, he's talking about people that know God and their lives should be different, amen? So this is who he's talking about. So don't exclude yourself like, okay, well, he's not talking about me. No, this is where we all have that thing called humanity on the inside of us, and we can err, but thanks be to God that we can go back to God and get back on the right path. Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul is telling Timothy, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, So we talked about last week, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. They will be traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Give me a hand clap for reading all that scripture, because that's a lot of scripture to stay on point, to not lose my place. So that takes some effort. So I want to I want to zero in on one of these words and we'll kind of wrap it all up. But don't don't kind of tune me out. This is not a negative message. This is a challenging message where God challenges us uh, on a daily basis. So I want to go to verse 4 where it says, they will be traitors. Everybody say traitors. Traitors. Not Trader Joe's, but traitors. Everybody immediately thought about Trader Joe's. I know you did. You thought about, man, I got to check the sales for Trader Joe's and get my Christmas goodies. And I know you guys. He said, they will be traitors. So immediately I went and I looked up that definition, the word traitor. And if y'all take a note, I encourage you to do so, or just make a note in your phone where you can go back and really dive into this later on. But a traitor is one who betrays another's trust or is false to an obligation or duty. Everybody say obligation. obligation. Now, when you hear that word obligation, does that come with a positive feeling or a negative feeling? Usually the negative feeling, obligation, because nobody wants to feel what? Obligated. Nobody wants to feel obligated. Well, we're going to have a different twist today. So I looked up the word obligation. Y'all ready for this one? Because nobody wants to feel obligated, Karen. Nobody. I don't want to feel obligated to show up. I don't want to feel obligated to, you know. So obligation means an act or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. An act or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. Also means a duty or commitment. Everybody say commitment. Here's my favorite one right here. The word obligation. If you're going to write down anything, write this one down. It means a debt of gratitude for a service or favor. Everybody say debt. It's a debt of gratitude for a service or favor. A debt of gratitude. So when you hear the word obligation, going back to that, to that, it's, a, it's an act, a course of action. Going back to the word traitor, one who betrays another's trust or is false to an obligation. And here's the thing, if we're going to be followers of Christ, there are certain things we are obligated, everybody say obligated. There are certain things we're obligated to do. Now, here's the thing, I can't imagine Jesus saying this. I can't imagine Jesus Christ saying this. Hey, 
I'm going to pay for your debt. I'm going to pay for your sins. I'm going to go to the cross, be beaten and crucified. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to lay down my life so that you don't have to. But I don't want you to feel obligated to do anything for me. I can't imagine Jesus saying that. Can you? I can't imagine Jesus saying, I'm going to let somebody whip me, beat me. I'm doing this for you so that you don't have to go through it. But hey, don't feel obligated to do anything for me. Don't feel obligated. I mean, it almost sounds like oxymoron. It almost sounds like, oh. Because so many times in today's culture, especially when it comes to to the things of God or um, even with church attendance, you know, we use this, man, don't feel obligated to come. But I can't imagine, you know, that's church. Don't feel obligated to come to church, but I'm not going to put that in the same sentence. Hey, don't feel obligated to follow Jesus. Y'all tracking with me? Because basically all he did was just kind of lay down his life and gave his life for you, was whipped and beaten and put on the cross. and Yeah. <laughs> like people do that every single day. Don't feel obligated. Here's the truth. We're not obligated out of guilt. But we are obligated out of gratitude. Okay? Let's do the paradigm shift. We're not obligated out of guilt. Don't guilt me into doing anything. Jesus will never guilt you into doing anything. He won't guilt you into following him. He won't guilt you into going to church. He won't guilt you into reading the word of God. He won't guilt you into representing him. But if there's a gratitude, that comes from him laying down his life, the gratitude will obligate you. Does that make sense? It's being obligated out of gratitude. Not obligated out of guilt, but I am obligated out of gratitude to serve Jesus. I'm obligated out of gratitude to walk in obedience to his word. I'm obligated out of gratitude to love others. How many would say, you know, there are some things about your life that you'd never want somebody to find out? You're so scared, you don't even want to raise your hand because you think we're going to judge you. We're not a judgmental church. Nobody's going to judge you. Everybody's looking at one another like, I know they should be raising their hand. and I'm, they, how they, They're lying right now. They're just... <laughs> but the truth of the fact, let me know God knows everything about you. Still loves you. That should obligate us out of gratitude. I'm obligated not out of guilt, but I'm obligated out of gratitude to share the gospel with other people. To share the good news with other people. There has to be an obligation for you and I if we're going to be followers of Christ. Now, I know the world has this way or, or even sometimes, you know, church has made us feel like, man, if, if, how many ever felt like if you missed church, you know, I remember, you know, now I'm from Kojic. You know, I don't know if anybody knows Kojic background, Church of God in Christ. Y- y'all think three services a month is tough. No, no, y'all ain't, see, I got you beat, Kojic. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night. Then Tuesday night. Then Friday night. He's up in the church. Now, was that out of obligation? As I look back now, it wasn't out of obligation of gratitude. But we felt guilty if we weren't there. At least Mama did. She made me go. I'm just saying. (laughs) Mama, it's okay if we miss one service. But there was this, this feeling of guilt. I mean, no, that's not God. Jesus will never guilt you. But it's when you come into the knowledge of what he's done for you, there should be a certain amount of gratitude that obligates you 
Once again, that obligation, a debt of gratitude for a service or a favor. To really break it down, Jesus did you a favor that you'll never be able to repay him. He paid a debt that you would never be able to pay. So I'm eternally obligated because of gratitude. I mean, that gratitude should never go away. When the gratitude goes away, we need to check up on our relationship with God. When we quit showing gratitude, when we wake up and we're not thankful and we don't have gratitude, then we really need to check up on our relationship, on our closeness with Jesus. Amen or ouch? I still love you. Y'all mad at me? I don't care. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> We're not obligated out of guilt, but out of gratitude. Don't get it twisted. Listen, don't don't sometimes I think we we can get stuff twisted and and it's you you ever hear people say, well, you know, Jesus knows me, he understands me. And sometimes we try to give ourselves a license to live how we want to, not how we should, according to the word of God. And the truth of it is, how I many know Jesus does know you, understands you, but it doesn't exempt you from letting the word of God transform you into who God wants you to be. Came across this scripture here, I think it's fitting, 1 Timothy chapter 4, because we have to be careful, guys. We, we can't fall into the cliches. We can't, we can't fall into a trap. Some people, I think, hit this moment. And they would even go so far as to justify their non-commitment to Jesus by saying, you know what, I can, Jesus understands me. I talk to him, you know, on my own or I do this. And it's not so much as you're trying to guilt people to being in a body of believers, but I believe this. I believe we can, we can start hearing from other people and we can sit there and say, okay, well, yeah, you know, that person's right. I don't, I don't, have, to, I don't have to do anything. I can just, you know... I can just sit here on my back porch and I can, I can have a, a fabulous relationship with Jesus. Doesn't require me to do anything and I don't have to go outside my house. I just, how I many know that's not truthful? Because if you've got a relationship with Jesus, it's going to require a lot from you. You're going to have to do something. You're going to, you're going to, it's obligation. <laughs> going back to this, an act or course of action. It's a debt of gratitude for his service or favor. So if I'm in relationship with Jesus, it does require me to represent him. It requires me to help other people. It requires me to be a disciple, a Christ follower. And being a Christ follower doesn't look like it's just me and my four no more. God, if you just take care of me and my family, that's it. No, no, no. We've got to get outside the four walls, amen? And we've got to go that extra mile. But don't Don't sit there and take on anybody else's doctrine. Listen, 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith. I think of that word abandon, leave. They will be traitors of the faith. They'll walk away from their moral obligation. Y'all tracking with me? I'm going to pat my own self on the back because I think this is good preaching. (laughs) They will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. One translation says doctrines taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciousnesses have been seared as with a hot iron. We've got to be careful. We've got to stay true, guys. Make no mistake about it. If we're going to be Christ followers, there has to be a level of obligation that we feel. You ever been somewhere and just out of the blue, you knew God spoke to you and you were supposed to help somebody? That ever happened to anybody? Huh? You, you just, and it wasn't like, like you felt compelled. Anybody ever felt compelled to do something? That's that obligation. And you can't shake it. You can't shake it off. You can't get rid of it. But it's an obligation. We're obligated. And, and, and I think there's so many times as well where we can almost talk ourselves out of helping somebody. 
You know, the other, a couple, couple Sundays ago after church, usually we do our, our grocery runs. And Grayson stayed with me, and Heather and Carrington went by themselves. And they called, they called us before they got home, before we even made it home, and told us something happened. And they were in the parking lot, right, Heather, at Aldi. And they were getting out of the parking lot, and this lady comes up to them. Uh, she could barely speak English. Uh, I don't even know if you really, I think, I don't even know what nationality she was, but, but she came up to them, and she was asking for, for food. Or, and Heather was like, well, I don't, I don't have any, any cash on me. She goes, no, I don't, I don't, no need cash, need food. And, and they felt obligated. It, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a, oh, man, now I got to help this person. I mean, no, that's not, that's guilt. But when God sets something up, I mean, no, you have to trust God. And it was almost like this holy obligation, man, I've got to help this person. And it's, it's uh, Heather took her into the store, got her a basket, and, and took her shopping. And all the while, Heather was like, man, I, I don't know how much she's going to put in the basket. Because that had been me, I'd have been like, no, put that back. But now I'm joking. <laughs> I'd be like, come on now, let's find a cheaper bread over here. But that's why I wasn't there at Aldi. Come on. That's why I wasn't the one there, because God knew that. I'd have broke out my calculator along the way. But that's why God didn't have me there. He had my wife there. Amen. And, and Heather and Carrington just followed her along, and she's putting stuff in the basket. And they don't know, because they can't, there's a language barrier, they can't communicate. But there was this holy obligation. There's, there's, that's when you just trust God, and, and you know God's, God, God set it up. And so as they're going along, and, and the lady's shopping, and, 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 and Heather and Carrington didn't interfere. They're just walking right behind her because they got to go pay for it. And it ended up being like, what, 50 some, 50, 40, 50 bucks? That, that was it. But that was that obligation. But how many times have we talked ourselves out of something because we thought somebody was trying to pull one over on us? But when you feel that holy obligation, this is going back to I'm obligated to act. There's a course of action in which a person is morally or legally bound. And I believe God, God will set up certain scenarios for us to, to allow that, that genuine obligation of gratitude. God, you've, God you've, you've, the debt I owed was more than $40, $50 for groceries. That's the holy obligation. So as we move forward, I want to just end with this here. This helping anybody today? Okay. We'll end up with this familiar story in John chapter 21. And this is, as we close out this Lovers of God series, do we really love God? That's, if you're taking notes, write yourself that question. Do I really love God? Ben, you guys are good. I'm not ready yet, but y'all can. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, y'all, y'all come on back, because I want y'all to hear this as well. <laughs> y'all give them a hand clap. They're so prompt. They just, they, they just, they thought, you're good, you're good. But in John chapter 21, this is where Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, and they finish breakfast, and Jesus goes into this Q&A. John chapter 21, verse 15, it says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, Man, how many know that would confuse anybody? <laughs> Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John. That's a lot of names going on. He said, do you love me more than these? I mean, hey, Peter, do you love me more than the rest of the crew here? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Feed my lambs. Now, the lamb is the, 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 the baby, Correct. You think of sheep, think of little lambs, and it's like, you know, the, the, the younger generation. I really believe God's called us if, uh, to, to feed this younger generation, to really be that light to this younger, younger generation. And, man, when you see the way the world's headed, how I many know this generation needs the light of God? They, they need positive role models. This generation needs people speaking truth to them. Amen. 
And he says, feed my lambs. And, you know, you could think of like baby Christians as well. But I just think of this younger generation. Jesus tells Peter, hey, feed my lambs. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question again. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The first Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now he's saying, take care of my sheep. In the Amplified, it says it this way. He says, he said to him, shepherd my sheep. Tend to my sheep. Shepherd my sheep, Peter. Now, when we think of shepherd, when you think of this in today's world, when you think of a shepherd, what, what title comes to mind? Ranch hand. Look at there. Awesome. That, that's a good answer. There you go. A ranch hand, a shepherd. In, in today's Christian arena, when you hear shepherd, what title do you think about? A pastor. And I think it's bizarre because we, I think there are some pastors God's called to shepherd, but you know what? I want to really break this down because Peter was not a pastor. He was what? A disciple, a follower of Christ. And Jesus is telling him, hey, if you really love me, I need you to shepherd my sheep. Tend to my sheep. Shepherd them. And I think if we're not careful, we forget that if we're Christ followers, part of our responsibility is to help shepherd the body of Christ. But culture has taught us to put it on one man that's on stage who has the title of a pastor. Y'all tracking with me? That's what what Christian culture has taught us. It's the pastor's job to shepherd the entire flock. And we wonder why so many pastors get stressed out. We wonder why so many pastors get, get to the point of taking their own lives. How many know that's a tragedy? get overburdened. But the real truth of it is, Peter was not a pastor, and Jesus said, hey, I need you to shepherd my sheep. Tend to my sheep. And once again, if we're going to follow Christ, I believe this is, this is, we're all obligated, not out of guilt, but out of what? Gratitude. Somebody's listening. Gratitude. I love the answer when I said, when you think of shepherd, what do you think about? She said, a a ranch hand. This is just somebody that's on on the farm. Without title or position. I don't think Jesus is into titles. He's in the towels. In the servants. And if we're going to follow him, we've got all have that obligation. God, how can I shepherd? How can I shepherd people that I work with? How can I shepherd others in my community? How can I shepherd people that I come in contact with on a daily basis? How can I be that shepherd? How can I and, and when you think of shepherd, it's 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 you ever heard the Jesus left the 99 for the for the one? So when you think of shepherd don't overburden yourself by thinking, man, I got I to gotta reach the 99. No, oftentimes it's that one person that God is calling you to shepherd. Just that one person that God's calling you to be that shepherd for. And it's not so much as like, hey, I just got to get them through the doors of the church and then I've done my job. No, you are the church. Let him experience you and your lifestyle. Be that shepherd. Be that light. Be the shepherd. Now, I was watching this movie, and, and I'm not one to give a lot of spoilers. But uh, <laughs> y'all knew that was coming, right? I, I, you know, uh, but it's, it's a movie that I saw. It was on the Disney Channel. And Steve was like, that's why he texted me, like, do you have, <laughs> I was going to get Steve to watch it and let me know what you thought about it. 
but it's called the shepherd. I won't give it all away. I'm going to try not to. But it's called the shepherd. And uh, John Travolta is in it and a couple other guys. But the setting, it was taken from a book that was written years ago. Uh, I think it's based upon uh, a book by an author by the name of Frederick Forsyth. So you can look it up later, but it's called The Shepherd. And anyway, this movie, I'll just give it like a recap of it. There's this, they're, on, they're in Germany. They're on a, uh, a naval air force base in Germany. And one of the pilots wants to fly home for Christmas, Rick. He's like, he's like man, if, you know, he calls his, his mom and like, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it. And uh, the other cadets are out there doing a snowball fight. And the guy who was going to use the plane broke his arm in a snowball fight. Go figure. And so the pilot's like, hey, I think I, got, I, think I can go ask if I can use the plane to fly home. So he goes to his commanding officer, and this is at nighttime, and he goes, he goes, man, you really want to fly out at night? He said, you just got passed for your night vision flying you know, a couple weeks ago. And he says, yeah, I think I can make it. He said, it's a clear night. Uh, the, the skies are clear. And he said, it's just flying in a straight direction, and I'll be home within an hour. And so they go through all the, the logistics. They give him the green light. He crawls into the plane. This is at nighttime. He takes off. And he's flying, and it's funny because he, he leaves like the land area, and then he's over the northern sea, and it's like, a, like, like black glass. You know, you know he's over the sea, and, and I'm feeling all of this like, ooh, because you know me, what am I thinking about? Sharks. Sharks. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm, he's flying out over the, the ocean, and it's like, but he's going, and like a few minutes after he takes off, and he's just flying over the ocean, all of a sudden, everybody say all of a sudden. All of a sudden, his instruments in his plane go out. His compass starts spiraling around, goes out. Navigation system goes out. His fuel gauge starts messing up. He's like in a crippled plane, and he's lost his direction. He's lost. Do you know anybody that's lost their way, lost their direction? Something has happened. You're, they're flying along, but they're not headed anywhere. And he's in this plane, can't communicate, nobody hears him. The naval base that he just left, they shut down. They said, as soon as you take off, you're on your own till you get to where they can hear you on the other end. He can't communicate with anybody, so he's just flying along. And all he remembered is he had to fly at, I think it was 30,000 feet, so he could use less fuel now in his mind, he's like, I don't know where I'm going, can't see where I'm going. And to make matters worse, it was a clear sky, and then all of a sudden fog rolled in. Now he's flying blind. So he thinks, I'm going to save fuel, I'm going to drop down to 10,000 feet. And he went into protocol, which was to fly in a triangle pattern. And he says, I'm just going to fly in this triangle pattern, and I'm hoping somebody hears me, and hoping somebody sees me. And he's flying in this triangle pattern. Ricky's lost. He can't see. Has no navigational system. Nobody with him. And he's lost. And I think about how many people in this world are lost without a navigational system. Without somebody to represent the light of God, the word of God. That's lost. No moral compass. Nothing to ground them. And he's flying in this triangle pattern. And he's watching his gas gauge just kind of go down like he's driving a V8 engine. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's just going down and down and down. And he gets down to maybe five minutes left of his gas. And he, he begins to write a letter to mom and his sister and his girlfriend who he thinks he's never going to see again. He's writing this letter. And then all of a sudden, he hears the hum of another engine. And he looks down below him in the clouds. You kind of see this other plane coming through. And as this other plane is coming through, finally you start hearing some static in the radio. And he picks up and, and, and they're, they're able to communicate just a little bit to where the guy in the other plane can hear him, but, but he can't hear the guy in the other plane. 
And so they finally made contact, and, and this guy is asking him, the first thing he asks him, he goes, he goes, do you have any structural damage to your plane as they're flying? And finally, they're able to communicate. He says, use sign language, and he holds up a map, and he goes, I don't, and he figures out he doesn't have any, any, any instruments that are working in his plane, and he tells him, then what I need you to do, he said, do you have any fuel left? He said, I think I got about, about three minutes of fuel. Well, he says, three minutes? And the guy's like, hey, I just need you to get behind me and follow me down. As he pulls in, he gets behind him and follows him down. I'm kind of giving away the whole darn movie, am I? That's all right. It's just going to drive. I've watched it like three times, so it'll just drive you to watch it. So he follows him down, and he gets him down there, and he says, in a few minutes, you'll probably see some runway lights, and then... And as they go down further, it's like all the clouds come in, and so you can't see nothing. And the guy's by himself again, and he sees some runway lights, and he goes down and he parks on the runway. So he's safe again. He makes it to safety. And this guy comes in this car and picks him up. And he's at this old military base that has been shut down for years. And the guy picks him up. And takes him back to the bunkhouse and this old dilapidated house falling apart and he gets him in there. He goes, he goes, we've been non-operational for years. We're almost, we're just a storage depot right now. And he takes him into the bunkhouse, starts a fire for him. And the young pilot is just so glad to be alive. He's walking around and he's looking at some pictures and he's looking at all these, these names on the wall of these young pilots that were, had lost their lives in the war. And he comes across this picture that's on the mantle. He said, hey, who is that? He tells him who that pilot was. And he goes, he said, that, he said, that pilot, I'm not going to tell you his name. See, I'm not going to tell you everything. <laughs> George called me out right there. He said, that, he, he said, that pilot is so-and-so. And, and he said, man, he was so instrumental. He said, during the war, he'd make it back, he'd land, refuel his plane, and take off, and he would just fly around the area looking for planes that were damaged and helping damaged planes land safely, people that had lost their way. Maybe they had structural damage, or, or he said, like you, maybe they lost their instruments, but he would guide them safely on his own time back in so they could land the young pilot looks at the old man. He goes, that's the, that's the pilot that guided me down here today. And the old man says, well, it couldn't have been. He said, that, that pilot took off Christmas Eve to this day, 14 years ago, to travel around to see if he could find any planes that were in the air that needed guiding back home. And he never returned lost his life in the northern sea. And at that moment, the, guy's here, the guy hears another car pull up. As he comes to that car, there's two guys from a nearby base that said, hey, we saw your plane land and we figured you need some help because this place has been closed for years. And he goes, no, the guy just, when he turned around, nobody was there. So you're not now, Pastor Don, you're telling ghost stories. No, <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story come to find out as I looked at the credits at the end of the movie it goes on to say how thousands of pilots Don lost their life during that war and said many more would have lost their life if it hadn't have been for certain pilots that were called shepherds that would make it back to safety refuel their planes, and on their own accord, fly back into the air, looking, listening for distress signals of other pilots that could barely see their way and make it back in, and they would guide them back into safety. They were called shepherds.
And I thought about you and I as we're Christ followers, guys. I believe we're all called to shepherd. First thing this pilot would ask people, hey, do you have any structural damage? In layman's terms, that's you and I. Hey, is everything going okay today? You with me? When you find out people are hurting, damaged, and wounded. How I many know you rub shoulders with people every single day that are going through something? You may not share it, but they're going through something. But it's God's calling us, not out of obligation of guilt, but out of obligation of gratitude. God, you helped me when I was hurting. God, you delivered me when I was going through something. God, you made a way for me when I couldn't see a way. I'm morally obligated out of gratitude to refuel my plane, get back in the air, and look for people that need help coming home. Amen? That need help coming home. Let me invite the band back up. We're going to get ready to close in just a few seconds here. Verse 17, the third time Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Then feed my sheep. Jesus went from take care of this younger generation, be a shepherd to my people. Then feed my people, encourage my people. And I believe God's called us to do for others what he does for us on a daily basis. That's why the word of God says, when it comes to the word of God, it says, this is our daily bread. You ever been going through something that you read the word of God and you feel a little better? the daily bread that we need that encourages us, that nourishes us. Let's be that for somebody else. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord God, just for who you are and all you are. I thank you for the challenge that you've given each and every one of us. Not to walk in obligation of guilt, but obligation of gratitude to follow you. We're obligated to follow you, obligated to serve you, obligated out of gratitude to say, yes, Lord. Even when it's outside of our comfort zone, we say, yes, Lord, because we're obligated. Even when it doesn't make sense, Father, may we be obligated out of gratitude to still say yes to your will and your way. Thank you, Lord, for the great love you've given each and every one of us in this room, those that are watching online. You've loved us with an everlasting love. already done so much for us that we'll never be able to repay you. So we stay in debt. A debt of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you that even as we enter into this moment of worship, Lord God. May the words that you've spoken to us today, may we, may we ponder on them. May we, may we go home and go back through them and just meditate upon it, Lord God. And Father, as we, as we consume it, Lord God, may it, may it come alive in our actions. Empower us to walk it out. We say we truly love you actions
show the gratitude that we have.